Welcome to Who's You Talking To with me, Jeff Hollerhead, and the legendary Arthur Beacon. Caravan. Arthur Caravan. So, Arthur Caravan, who are you? The guitarist, vocalist, locally. Been with quite a few bands over the years from about probably 1978. Upwards, left school at 15. Did nothing else. Saved me time as an engineer and also played guitar, but in general, since I was probably 20. Done nothing else but play and sing, so I never worked since. Just the bus in there. Uh, first of all, we had Gary Murphy on the other day, but you can check him out. The Jewel of the Banjos. Great guitarist, Gary, good friend of mine. And I honestly say, Gary was inspired and looked up to the man himself, Arthur. Yeah, me, Kenny Parry, a few other guys. But Gary's a bit, quite a bit younger than me, so they'd come and watch us and they'd be nicking all our bits of guitar playing and all that. And the way as you get older, you start forgetting things and Gary wouldn't give me any of them bits he nicked back. So he's <laughs> kept them all. And I can't do them now because he's robbed them. So I used to do Julian, but Julian yeah. Banjo was, uh, was great. I used to love doing it. Yeah. I stopped doing it when I was 15, 16. Just got bored and, just got and I bored. forgot it now. So Gary will understand that. <laughs> Little spoof, but obviously the major, the major band that uh, Arthur uh, went around the city was, was uh, the legendary, he's passed away now, Cy Tucker. And he was in the side Tucker band. Um, how many how many years were you with Side? Forty. Forty years with side Tucker. Yeah. So we're gonna go back and we'll go into more detail. But starting off, so you went to school. Did so? Tell me why. What what inspired what inspires the music? What what got you into guitar? I was never really interested in music that much when I was younger, 14, 15, 16, Whereas a lot of the lads started quite young. I started a little bit late, and it made quite a bit of difference in them days. Because if you miss the 60s, which were only a few years, like in, in 61, I was only like 10. Okay. So Tucker and all that were quite established by then. And some of the other musicians who were playing. So I, I really wasn't interested. And then at the age of 15, 16, you couldn't get a girlfriend. Because I always looked gay anyway. <laughs> so someone said, try playing guitar. And just started playing guitar and they were just coming up the trees. And that was just and that was it. Women coming from everywhere. I was made up. I was like, you're not gonna believe this, but I was an ugly baby. Yeah. Honestly. Seriously. <laughs> not laughing there, are you? No. <laughs> it won't just appeal to you. So when I got 17, 18, I, I played a little bit of guitar, but mainly I started singing then. In bands, just local bands, and then it went on from there, sort of a more of a singing career than actually being a musician. And then got back into guitar, sort of at a later date. And then sort of stayed on guitar then, you know, and sang. But you know, you're singing, I mean, we'll, we'll play on later on, but you have a high, tremendous sort of, is it like a Bee Gee voice? You know, yeah, like I, always had, I always had a really good range. Is that called, oh, was it? Not so Facetto. Facetto. Facetto, yeah. yeah. Facetto. Yeah, I think, it, again, a lot of the singers back in the very early days, you didn't, where does now singers can go, I don't like that key, lower it down. In them days, you didn't, you didn't have a key. A key change, yeah. You know, just yeah. the guitarist said, I've learnt it in A. And if that's what he learnt it, that's what you sang it in, or that's the record. So you had to really be able to sing quite well, because you had to sing all these different things. Different keys. I think I was one of the first ones in Liverpool to actually sing in stylistic stuff. And uh, you know, when you're playing in that, that Liverpool Ace and all the places where a lot of the musicians come from, it was quite, you know, someone would come in and they'd go, there's a white fella singing stylistics there. And they'd all be glaring at you. But I got known for singing that type of stuff. Me and a few other singers, we were one of the first to actually use falsetto as a main voice. Yeah, falsetto. Because I watched the Bee Gees interview and uh, they was they was, they was in Miami and uh, we're in a recording studio and it, for some, like, it was just a one-off and he, he, he sang in that sort of high-pitched voice, as you say, and uh, it was just, suddenly, it became the, 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 like, wow, it was in, you know, doing Saturday Night Fever and Staying Alive. Yeah, well, all, all the harmonies, all, a lot of the harmony bands, you always had someone doing a high falsetto pass because it set it off. But when, <laughs> when, you, when you sang with other singers, if a couple of could one could sing quite high and you put the falsetto on top, yeah. it would sound like it would sound like girls basically. So in some of the bands I was in, with, uh, one of the bass players, Dave Dover, and Kenny Parry worked with Dave Dover as well. 
when we done back in our days, it was like two girl singers coming in. And everyone used to say the same thing, it just sounds like girls, you know, which it did. <laughs> so, you know, that sort of went down sort of quite well, you know. But the audience loved it because that was the style as well, you know, to, 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 to do that sort of level of singing and take something. Because you give us a high note. Oh. I'll leave that with warm one up. Yeah, he's That's fantastic. Go on. I love the running. I love the running. How did you warm your voice up? Have you got any methods? Or? Drinking. <laughs> Drinking was always a big part. I mean, it always, I think when you started playing or like, you know, you, you had like the odd drink or something like that. But after, after a while, yeah, certain bands you were in, they all tended to be drinkers. Most bands drank. I remember the. Uh, one of the bands I was in from Wigan, Rainbow Cottage. And then um, I had to go and I had to go and see them up in uh, Blackpool. Yeah. And they just they just on top of the pops so and the guitarist was leaving. And they'd have, they'd come and see I was in a band in Blackpool and they'd come and see me and said, Will you come down and have an audition? So I went down, they were on a big place in Blackpool. The tower, you know. Yeah, the tower. So it goes in and uh, he goes on, it was a big light show, 28k rig, fabulous and met them and he said do you want to come in the dressing room and they were talking as we were walking through they were talking about you know what's your musical interests and what's this and that you know and when we were I very I hardly answered any questions as they opened the dressing room door there was a big cooler box and a keg of lager and a pump screwed on the table <laughs> and he said do you want a pint of lager and I said I wouldn't mind thanks very much and they all had a pint of lager they were on their break and uh, they said well, what do you want to do I said I'm joining I'm jo- this is why I'm joining. Just because you have a catch. Do you want this all the time? They went, well, yeah, when we do social clubs and all that, we tend to take it in. Because otherwise it saves, and I went, this is just the band for me. This is great. I'm signing the band. So there you go. I was an alcoholic by the time I was like 19. Did you ever, 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 ever get on stage and you're absolutely nearly poetic? Funny enough, very rare. Yeah. I think, it I think with Tucker, it, I think it happened. Probably in 40 years, it happened about four or five times as a push. I think twice where I was just absolutely walked in. I was trying to tune the guitar. It took it, he'd never tell you off if you were drunk because he knew it was pointless. Because you, he, t- he might say something the next day. <laughs> but I remember I walked up, the lads carried me in this pub in Heighton. And then yeah. I, I got my guitar out and I was going, oh my God, I'm going to fall over. And I was tuned up on the drum. I was bending down doing something you know so I'm just tuning off and that and Tucker was going <laughs> you alright yeah I'm fine I'm okay <laughs> and I said to the drummer I said Les I think I'm in trouble I've had a few drinks and he went you've had a few drinks <laughs> I haven't been up <laughs> <laughs> so he was absolutely he was worse than me he goes on starts playing and Tucker's going are you going to get anything right he said, oh, shut up. But that's it, on the odd occasion. But very rare, you know. Yeah, but the thing is, I think you were a tight band, you because know, if I realised Tucker never really drank when I was there, when I no. was playing, never drank. It was mm-hmm. on his water. Was, was that for his career, didn't go? Yeah, pretty much so. He drank when he, in the early days, when he was yeah. younger. And he drank like brown, when all that drank, he drank. And then he, he sort of like, he was one of these guys who could actually just enjoyed himself without yeah. a drink. So when you went to Holly, he was quite funny because when he started drinking, he was really funny. You know, his, his personality was just great when he was drunk. But he was he was like a dead weight. He was a big man. Yeah. And he'd just become like, if he fell over, he, it'd be hard to pick him up. It's true. And it was only ever like on holiday that he'd get drunk. And one time, I think one time we were doing at a club in Bootle. And uh, in the club's end days, you went on quite early. So you'd go on about 8.30. And you come off about post past nine, and then the guy would go, Okay, lads, second spot's 11 o'clock. And you go, <sighs> So we all goes in the back bar. Tucker goes, Do you know what? I might have a wine and soda. And Dave Dover said, Well, they do that Australian white, the little balls of Australian white. And I said, Well, I've never drank Australian white, I don't know what it's like. So Tucker went, Give us four of them Australian white, please, we'll all have one. So Australian white lemonade. And I want to drink beer. I've never drank shorts or wine. So I'm going, it's all right, this isn't it? It's nice, like. Sweet. I'm just sitting there, <laughs> and uh, Tucker's like, oh, it's lovely, that. 
and he wrote, he was a big lover so if he got if he bought you a drink then it was you got to get around him he wouldn't walk, he wouldn't go you know he'd go uh, he was getting the next ones so he know that you know that you can drink four of these Australian whites so we all drank four of them and out, out of all of us we were all sorts of used to drink it so it was the worst <laughs> and he got as he walked through as we walked through the social club you see the people going look at Tucker banging chairs, banging to get on the stage and we start playing and he's just laughing, he's just singing <laughs> and all the people are going, oh my god we've never seen you him drum and he hadn't and he's, he's, going, he's going off his head and we had to do the whole, I, I was coming and singing, the bass player's coming and singing we were a bit gone but he was legless Tucker he's, and again he still had to drive home like you that was one of the things with Tucker with not drinking he, he loved driving yeah. So he was all, wherever he went, he was in his car. And he might have a wine and soda or two. But he generally always goes, no, I'm in my car, you know. Back then, though, you know, back then, it was obviously, uh, there wasn't much force. Drinking driving was in full force, you know. Where, you know I, I mean, uh, I've only had five, I'm okay. You know, people like that. I mean, obviously, it, it's totally to oh, it was, a, it was, a, it was oh, yeah. I think it was, a, it was a no-no then. Yeah. But I think it was more ignored then. With ignored, that. Was, yeah. You know, it was wrong. But yeah. a lot of people did drink and drive. It was, a, it was a culture then, you know, if you're an entertainer, you know, you'd, you'd get in the van and you'd be driving or, you'd, you know, he didn't think, you know, you wouldn't get bladdered every night. Yeah. You'd have two or three pints or whatever. Then we'd have some night, you always have a few drinks, but in general, you only had a couple of pints and then you'd, you'd drive home, you know. Well, God, be, God willing, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. But look, let's go back to the girls you were saying about, say, uh, what have you mentioned before? Back to that. Yeah, <laughs> they might be the worst in now. So soon you, you had no girlfriends because in, in, no. in school you were nicknamed. It was a cami. Cami, yeah. Why was that? Because oh. I had those spots. <laughs> I had a really good complexion when I was young. I always looked young when I was young. So when I was, and then someone said to me, "You want to start lying about your age, and just say you're, you're actually older than you are." So I thought well, that's okay. Everyone done it then, you know. So when I was nineteen, he said I was twenty. When I was twenty, I'd say I was twenty-two, you know. Which works out great. Which of course you get to around forty, and someone goes, "How old are you?" You go, "I'm forty. You, you know, you've got to be forty-three." And you go, "No, no." And then you're in denial, and aren't you going, "I'm not. I'm only 40. And then you start carrying your passport around because I wouldn't be going. <laughs> no, you can't because you told me. I remember your birthday last year. You said you were th- forty, thirty, and no, I was. No, but yeah, I was lied about. I was put three years on. Get lost, yeah. you're forty three, mate. And it took me ten years to get yours of it. Do you know what though? You're looking in good shape, aren't you, mate? Absolutely, your hair's still there. That's the only thing, yeah. Everything else from there down, nothing works. But me, me hair, <laughs> up, up here, up here's fine. You know, all lads used to say, I think Tucker used to say, he says to me, no difference. They come in and they go, I tell you what, Tucker, ah, that looks well, don't he? He goes, it always looks bleeding well, don't he? He'd go like that. Like that, he'll go. Yeah, I can't wait. You're laughing, mate. Can't wait because he's just going. That's how he looks. He's, he, if he's he's drank all. I've worked all my life. Looked after myself. Never, he's drank all his life. He drinks every single night of the week, and he'd be going mad because he, he, he obviously he think I go first, like which I was quite expecting, especially from the age of forty onwards. Like Christ, I mean, obviously, when you when you know when you hear those uh, the story about what happened, uh, yeah. You know, you were gigging, wasn't that right? Was you, was you gigging? Yeah, we, the, on the Tuesday, which was the 17th. By the following Tuesday, he'd gone. It was just all surreal, you know, phone calls of him going into hospital and not being too good, then coming home on the Saturday and then going back in on the Sunday, on the early house Sunday morning, Saturday night. And then in on the Monday that he was very poorly. And they get the phone call Tuesday morning. So where, where did it start? Where was your plane? Where, where did you think yourself? We done Central Hall, a few bars around there, you know, where the Liffey. Okay. So we, we we couldn't figure out where anything was picked up. Although some people, after the Sunday afternoon in Central Hall, some people weren't well on the Monday. But so, me and Tucker were fine. Is, this, is it Mark last, is it like around St. Patrick's Day last year? It was Paddy's Day. That was the third Just Tuesday. Just before the lockdown, yeah. That was that. It was all we said. It's all going to lock down on the Friday or the Saturday. Yeah. So we thought, well, um, I said, I'll see you Friday, or will it? He said, yeah. And then I'd say his wife phoned me Thursday and said he, he took him in. We, he had a heart attack quite a few years ago, but he got over that. And that's why he stopped playing guitar. I remember he used to play guitar. Yeah. When he come back playing, 
couldn't stand the guitar because of his scar. Yeah, okay. So he come back uh, just singing, and he just sang better and better. His voice, you know, that that weekend he died, his voice was just unbelievable. People would come up to me and go, what the voice sounds so Yeah. You know, his voice was fabulous. On the, on the last night, when his, his grandson had come in with some friends, a couple of his mates, and sat down. So Tucker went to move to the manager asked Maureen, the owner. Yeah. Um, do us a favour, Maureen, give the lads a bottle of champagne off me, you know. So she went, okay, Tucker. So she goes over to the lads, says something to them. We didn't know what, like. And she also winked at me. Next thing she goes over to the champagne. It's on the table, Tucker comes off. I go, ah, oh, hey, Tucker, you shouldn't have got that, mate. Grandad, you shouldn't have done that, that's too much. Tucker went, nothing's. You're my grandson, nothing's too much for you. All enjoy yourselves. He went, this is like, this is the best champagne we've ever seen. They sell this in a club in town. It's dead expensive. So I went, doesn't matter. Get it down, you. Yeah. When you say dead expensive, well, well, I mean, you know, well, they went, it's dead expensive, took okay. So next thing, Morgan said, I'm going to give him the bill for the champagne. So yeah. she goes over and she goes, yeah, it's okay. And he goes, ta, Maureen. Pocky. And they're all going, oh my God, don't want to pour too much out, it's just so expensive. And he's going, and we're all standing watching him. Next thing he's like, down his pocket, he's going. And he's looking down, he's trying to focus, and he can't <laughs> see it. But I think all he's, he's seen like 400. And she gave him this bill for 400 pounds with the champagne, which we knew was about 30 quid. We're crying, and he's going. And in the end, he's seen it, and he's looking around, and he's better go and tell him. And this is, this is the night, and he's going to keel over. So she went over and told me, she stood up, he went, you shan't. <laughs> well, he just, he quite, he, his face was like white. Oh, he wound him up. Could have cost another thing, because obviously people say, oh, you love this pie, he's talking. Oh, I love this yeah. food. He used to come out, I think, before they had the heart attack, they'd be playing Sunday afternoons. Yeah, seen it. And uh, we always used to laugh at Tucker, he'd say, if you ever want Tucker to sit at your table, just put some food on the table. And Tucker would literally, Walk in the pub and he'd, he'd be looking around and then he'd go, All right, how are you doing, John? How's it going, mate? And the fella go, yeah, Okay, sorry, what, what's that? No, mate, are you okay? Nice to see it. How are you, my love? You okay? Hey, hey, look nice, don't he? And we'd be standing by going, And he'd hear a sausage roll. Mm, lovely, then. Lovely, then. They got ribs, they got ribs on. See in a minute. And they go up and they go across. And they go, all right, all right, Charlie. All right, talk. Hey, ribs. And that's what he done. He done that all the time. I used to go, when he had first, first had the heart attack, I, I went in on Sunday afternoon and I said, you've all done this to him, all bringing food in. Because they all started bringing it in for him then. Yeah. Him, him and his mates, they'd all sit down and he'd wander around and he'd, whatever was going, they'd eat. I've seen pies get passed up to him. On stage, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's hot. He's your favourite, day. And he's, he's been singing, and he still took a bite of the pie, <laughs> carried on singing. And I'd be going, how do you do that? Especially you know, the old ones, you're getting pies. Me and most of the lads in the band, we'd, yeah. you know, we'd never eat anything. I'd never eat when I'm out. You know, we'd never eat when I'm working, because it's all in your teeth. But so I'd just eat anything. And one time we were on the little yarn, we were doing, um, we were on Cooper's, and they had a big buffet on, it was a Christmas time. So on the front, time. by St. Yeah. James's, uh, yeah. Cooper's Emporium, and they used to have yeah. ticket nights, so they put this big buffet on. You know, he took a ghost to me, um, have you ever had that lobster? And I said, oh, it's fabulous. It's Do you like lobster? And he said, never had it. I said, well, there's two there. He went, I don't know, what do you do with them? I said, well, I just leave it until the buffet's finished, and then wrap it up, take it home. I said, do you think so? I said, yeah. So, next thing he goes over, he's got the lobster, he's got some tin for and he's going to me, I'm going. And he wraps it up and he puts it in the fridge in the kitchen. And then he goes on to the second spot and he has a break, whatever. Then we're all standing around and it's about half one in the morning. Tucker goes to the fridge, gets the silver foil, foil lobster, and he's going at me. He went, what, what do you have with it? He gets some mayonnaise, like a dip, some nice brown bread and butter, it's lovely. <laughs> Just dip it and dip it in, and he went. So off he goes. So we're all we're all in the pub. I've given it a thought, you know. Tucker so goes on, and he gets it. He went. Right, and do some brown. I said brown bread and butter. Do a couple. Of, so she said, okay, slice it. He said he's like that with the bib. Knife and fork. Come on, girl, bring it in here. 
Brown bread. Oh, some mayonnaise in the little bowl. Mayonnaise in the little bowl. Oh, I can't wait to try this, girl. Have you have you tried it? She went. I'm, I don't want any. It's okay. He's got <laughs> lobster. It's dead expensive. Arthur said it's dead expensive. She said, I don't fancy it. It's okay. It looks like sausage meat. And he went. What do you mean it look? Charles. <laughs> and she goes out in the kitchen. She went. I think someone's opened it. Crushed sausages and pushed them all in. Someone's had the meat out of it. <laughs> We don't, we don't let, we don't let it. All at the lobster, put all the little sausages, squash them all up, shove them all in, put it all back together. She's yeah. open, she's going, I don't really fancy it. <laughs> the phone went to ours the next morning. And Christine answered the phone and he went, put the seam, he put them on, and she went, I said, I'm not, I'm not coming to the phone. She I wouldn't get on the phone, he was <laughs> getting on. He was going for the And he walked, when he walked into Cooper's, because we were on there the Sunday afternoon, as he walked in, all the staff run, they all lit, so there's no one behind the bar. And he was walking down the pub going, I'll find you, I know what you just did to me. Because we told everyone, like, that was talking his love of food. <laughs> okay, stand by for part two of more Tucker and Arthur Tales. <laughs>